Happy New Year, viewers. Welcome to this show, The State of the State of Hawaii. This is a bi-weekly show on Mondays. Today, the topic of the show is about Hawaii schools post-COVID after closures and interruptions and other dilemmas that we've experienced over the last period of that, that awful COVID pandemic. And um, our question, as uh, posted, is uh, now that schools are open, um, are um, they restoring learning? So we'll have some interesting talk about how that's going and how much that costs and how it is supported. So, um, Sherry, welcome to, to you for coming on the first day of this new year. Well, thank you, Stephanie. I'm so glad to be back again on uh, the state of the state. Well, I'm really pleased because this is an ongoing topic. It's not anything that is just presentable in one little session, session or statement. And I know people can follow the Department of Education's website, which is, um, as you know, up there under... Um, HawaiiPublicSchools.org. It's a lot of information, a tremendous amount of information. And of course, it has to change all the time too as, as uh, everything becomes clearer. But Sherry, I thought maybe you could start us out about how you go about knowing what's going on <laughs> with this situation in terms of, first of all, what is the status of the learning challenge out there? Where, where what is it that the department has to cope with, the Department of Education and all of the schools have to cope with now as a result of the pandemic? So can you just describe the task as you see it? And then we can go on and talk about how to meet the needs. Sure. So um, just a, a bit about my group. Uh, it is a coalition of nonprofits and parent groups. And we all came together about 12 years ago to engage uh and understand what's going on at the Department of Education. So the way we do that is by attending all Board of Education meetings, uh, all uh, education legislative sessions, or as many as, as possible, or where we uh, feel there is priority amongst our members. And we just consistently keep in touch with uh, the department's reports to the board, and also legislation that affects our public school system. So we've been doing this for the past 12 years, and really that's how we keep up with the status. So moving on to what has happened in the past really three years since the pandemic started in 2020, um, you can imagine it was a shock to uh, the whole system, uh, having to close schools for a while, having to do uh, hybrid learning or distance learning at one point, and then that turned into hybrid learning. And to finally, uh, last year, the department returned to in-person le learning 100%. So we've gone through a lot. And I really wanna thank and appreciate all of the educators and of course the families and the students for persevering and, and doing their best amidst this really uh, complicated and difficult time. But what en ended up happening or what is what is happening as we speak is uh, because of the of the instability and inconsistency of uh, instruction and just the, you know, social, emotional well-being of students being affected, um, we've had some uh, learning loss, uh, especially amongst our um, high need students, the economically disadvantaged the uh, English learners and the students receiving special education uh, because their um, instruction was uh, disjointed a bit. Uh, you can imagine they, um, they, they struggled. I would say all students struggled, but uh, the high need students struggled uh, even more. And that's really what uh, we need to address uh, going forward. Uh, this has been a priority of the Board of Education. It is certainly a priority of the coalition. And uh, of course, we want to get all students back to where we were pre-pandemic. Um, but in particular, we want to pay attention to the students who uh, have the greatest needs. And so that's where we're focused. And uh, uh, the it seems the board and the department are also focused 
in that area as well. So you would say you were aligned with the the mission of of the Department of Education. So the the way they lay out their 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 uh, activity going forward, you're you're looking at it in the in the same manner. So they see that the they see the demand that's out there for these special groups of youngsters, well, all of them actually, but to make sure that all of the students, the the special as the uh, English language learners and those that you mentioned, the high need, are are seen to um to so that they can make as much progress as they need to as well. So I mean, do you? Do you align yourself purposefully that way or do you superimpose? Do you have other goals beyond that? I'm not asking you to give us any big secrets, but I was just wondering about what is your your strategy? Well, it all uh, encompassing. Yes, we focus in on the data and uh, we hope that the department is data driven as well. Uh, They say they are. And uh, recently they did present a a large amount of data uh, regarding the past three years, uh, how students did in uh, the Smarter Balance Assessment, which is the state assessment um, that's uh, given to students in certain grade levels. And uh, we've followed what the data says. And according to that data, so just uh, in sum, Pre-pandemic, we had certain levels of performance academically. Um, And even pre-pandemic, there were differences between the non-high-need students and the high-need students. We call that the achievement gap. And in Hawaii in particular, we've had a persistently difficult, uh, a a persistently wide gap where there is a a difference in the performance of the non-high-needs and the high-need students. During the pandemic, all students declined in academic performance. You can imagine because of these exogenous shock of the of the pandemic and this uh, inconsistency in the type of instruction, all students went down, but our high need students fell further. Last year, uh, it was the first year of all in person instruction. So fortunately, there was a rise with all students. Of course, the rise was greater for the non-high-need students compared to the high-need students, but we haven't recovered back to pre-pandemic levels. So our uh, priorities really stem from what we see in the data. And we think that uh, because the high-need students really had a disproportional impact, uh, had disproportional the uh, negative impacts from the pandemic, uh, we feel that there needs to be a particular supports uh, for them, appropriate supports, so that they can get back on track, uh, I- as well as, of course, the non-high need students. Well, do you think that the department is looking as closely at the data as as or can you discern that they are using the data to guide their thinking about priorities and and um, assistance? Yes, uh, I do believe that the department is looking at the data and their intention uh, and their objective is to try to get all students back on track. And they're certainly aware that there's these disparities. What is not so uh, clear to us is how. And this is where um, we keep asking uh, the department to articulate uh, more uh, clearly um, so that we can all understand how uh, the schools uh, or the system as a whole is trying to address this systemic problem. Um, Yeah. So I was going to say, when you say data, that they look at the data, um, and they, we're talking about the Strive Hawaii um, um, set of um, assessments, correct? So that that is the data that, that would be driving their yes. decision. So there and are four. See that data on on the website. Anybody, FYI, can go up to those websites and take a look at that Strive Hawaii data. Okay. Correct. So when they use do that okay and then you're just saying that the way they look at it the how part of it is where um you are um interested to know more 
Well, the department has a number of um, webs, uh, number of sites uh, portraying what you referred to, which is the Strive High data system. So just so that people are aware, the Strive High system is a set of indicators that was established by the superintendent, uh, two superintendents ago, which was a way for uh, stakeholders or the public to see how the par department was doing with these indicators. So examples include the proficiency results from the Smarter Balance Assessment. There's also a look at chronic absenteeism. There's a look at college going rates. There's a look at third grade literacy. There's a look at teacher retention, uh, teacher retention rates. Uh, so it's 14 indicators where we can, with these indicators, see the status of how the system is doing. So um, when I say data, when I was referring to data before, yes, it is the Strive High data, but it also is focusing in on the state um, assessments for example, English language arts, mathematics, and science, which are shown by the results of the Smarter Balance Assessment, which is the state assessment that uh, uh, evaluates whether or not a student is proficient in common core standards for that particular grade. So every state has a state assessment. Hawaii has chosen uh, the Smarter Balance Assessment, and every state also has standards that they adopt, for which defines in each grade level what a student is supposed to master. So mm -hmm. when we look at the Smarter Balance Assessment or academic performance in English language arts, mm -hmm. math, and science, we see that there has been a decline since the pandemic in all subjects, actually, and uh, a rise in all subjects um, except the, I should, let me take that back. There has been improvements, but not a rise back to pre-pandemic levels. So where we are actually doing well in uh, is in English language arts. Again, we are making greater improvements in English language arts than we are in mathematics and science. So getting back to your original question, the Strive High system is a series of indicators. Amongst those, the Smarter Balance Assessment results are looking at proficiency in certain subjects like English language arts, math, and science. And by those results, we can see how our high needs and our non-high needs students have performed, and we can see the trends of where they are. So that's kind of what we look at. Of course, we look at the other indicators too, but the proficiency uh, is one of the indicators. It's just one indicator that is uh, quantitative and measurable, and we can see the movement of how our students have fared during the pandemic. So when you say proficiency, that is the the criterion or the marker for something like maybe grade level um, of, of performance or it's, a, it, it's the what what does proficiency mean if parents get this data, which I hope do they get the data? That's another question is do um, they get the smarter balance information about their students and are, are they presented to PTA or what have you? And then what does proficiency mean? Proficiency means uh, whether or not a student has um, is proficient in the common core standards for that grade level. So the uh, evaluation, it goes one, two, three, and four for a student, um, whether they have, they've not not um, met proficiency, whether they're nearing proficiency, whether they've met proficiency, or whether they've exceeded. So that's the way a student is evaluated. And then they aggregate all of this, and you can see the percentage of proficient or nearing or not uh, meeting uh, for a particular school. So it's whether they, 
depending on the score uh, that a student uh, uh, receives on the assessment, they can uh, indicate whether or not a student is nearing, meeting, not meeting, or exceeding proficiency. Now, do the uh, does okay? Do our interest, of course, as your your organization's interested, is in the the stakeholders, of course, the the communities and the parents who want to know what's happening um, in the schools with their children, right? And are people um, are you finding that people are are getting information about these? these data that presume that you're suggesting are driving the the DOE's uh, decision making like it drives your work but a little different level of <laughs> okay so yeah. yes so yeah. there is a lot of information on the department of education website a lot navigating it is another uh, issue it's very difficult to find information about your student uh, if I'm a parent um, I don't think individual student information is on the website. So a school delivers uh, information about their student to parents. I actually don't know if the Smarter Balance Assessment results is provided to parents. I think there's evaluation, there are report cards, and there are grades given to students. But um, the state assessment is usually reported in aggregate uh, way. So either a school uh, will show the proficiency, uh, percentage proficient students of that particular school, or it's we can look at it as a state, uh, how we're doing the number of, the percent of proficient students uh, in our state for particular uh, subject matter. So going back to your question, the information may be there, but it's difficult to find. Now, the yeah. reason I, I'm able to, or our coalition is able to navigate is because we pay attention and make it a point to find it and understand it. It is not well, that easy for somebody who just, you know, doesn't know anything and goes on the website to find the information that they need. It is it is a, a, a challenge to try to find the information um, I've spent many hours on the website trying to find the right information. I, I think that that's a good caution. But the fact of the matter is you can go up there. And I know I just recently yesterday looked up there to make sure that um, I I knew what I could see and easily understand. And I did find that all of the school's performances on, on those indicators are listed by school uh, from yes. grades four seven, six, I think, three through six, three through, three through six, because of course three three is important for the English language learning, for the English language arts, certainly the reading. But anyway, I'm just mentioning that so uh, viewers know that they can go up there and take a look at, you know, their, their school for sure. And then maybe there's other information they can glean too. Now, but it, yeah, go ahead. Now I do want to mention that the proficiency data isn't the only data. And uh, there are uh, many stakeholders who, uh, don't want to focus just on uh, this smarter balance assessment. After all, a child is a whole child, and this is just one component. Now, that said, um, the school system doesn't have really great measures for uh, assessing other things. Uh, recently, the department did a or uh, launched a assessment for social emotional learning. It's trying to look at sort of the um, emotional state of students. Um, there's also satisfaction surveys. So it's not the, the proficiency data isn't the only thing. And of course, in the Strive High uh, system, you're looking at other factors like absenteeism or looking at uh, the new teachers and how long they stay or teacher retention rates. Uh, you're, you're looking at facilities. You're also looking you're looking more at the total system. So it's just that for proficiency, that seems to be what um, stakeholders uh, do want to know, whether or not a student is doing well in their academics. And so it tends to be a focal point, but I wanna mention that it's not the only uh, element that 
we we should be concerned with. Very, very important point. Yes. Well, I wanted to switch over now to the other helper in this um, effort to, to bring our students back to um, their best performances, and that's the federal government and the the funding that has come to all states, including Hawaii. And I, we have very little time, but I just wanted to not get too bogged down in nomenclature here or acronyms, but we are now at the beginning of 2023. And as I understand it, and um, the ESSER, which stands for the Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, which is the federal government's funding for states, for schools to, to um, mitigate learning loss and uh, get schools back in order again. Now, the, the first, the, this year, the funding is at the level of, um, the funding level of. I think it's seven, 400 and some odd million was the yeah. last tranche, but there's been almost 700 million issued uh, during the pandemic of supplemental federal funds. Yes. And I, I, I know we don't have much time, but I've, I'll just mention, um, I'll try to, to summarize. So yeah, let me just say that. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. let me just say that those funds, as you say, the first one is, as you said, and I think the second one is like 400 and that one lapses at the end of 2024. So right. there's a big tranche that's gonna lapse this year, which is that many tens of millions of dollars. And then into the into next year, we have that. So with 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 that funding coming in, do you see that um, we're getting enough information or the stakeholders, the community, the parents are getting to understand how much support we have in Hawaii as, as well as in the other states to make a difference and to get us out of this predicament. How, how do you see that going now? Are um, they, you... No, we do not have the information to know how those funds are being used. And that has uh, been a very frustrating point uh, for uh, myself and the coalition we keep asking. Uh, one of the issues is um, our system is one of empowerment. So a lot of discretion is left up to the individual schools. And because individual schools do different things, it's hard for the department to articulate as a system what we're doing uh, as a system to address, in particular, our high needs students. because if all the schools are doing things differently, it's hard to consolidate that information and uh, communicate it back to stakeholders in a way that's really systematic and understandable. Um, so we really don't know how the funds are being used. And that is something that, once again, I keep asking the department and it's it's difficult to get a to co get a coherent explanation. So what are you? Um, this would mean that the accountability plan is not clearly presented or stated for how they're going to assess what's going on in every school and across the counties and in the state, right? So are they lacking an accountability plan, um, or is is there is it? How, how yes. Does the so it's um, it's difficult to ensure accountability. Um, we never the, the the leadership never established clear goals or targets or objectives uh, for the use of these federal funds. Uh, um, so we almost have to just trust the fact that the department is using the monies well. Uh, we don't know how they're tracking improvement besides these annual uh, state assessments. Um, and once again, it is it's difficult to know whether or not we are really getting a good return on investment on these funds. And they're precious funds. It's a one time unprecedented situation where we have these supplemental funds. So you would hope that we could use it in the most uh, strategic way. Uh, but it's not clear to us. Okay, and it is an enormous amount of funds, and you're so right. This isn't going to happen again. And I do, I do have my numbers here, and I just wanted to say them again that for um, ESSER two, which is um, 
money this for this year, 2023. And that figure is $183.6 million. And this is up on the Department of Education's website. And the S are three monies that are going to lapse in 24. So that'll be the end of it there. So um, that's $412.5 million. So um, it would um, it, it would be interesting to see um, how that is getting parsed out and what future plans they may have to do the kinds of things you're talking about they might need to do, Sherry. So do you all make recommendations to the department um, or the state or what, what how does that start? What's the feedback loop we, from the state? Side we of it. we do we do <laughs> what we have suggested very shortly is um, there are schools that are exemplary. Like I said, schools have a lot of discretion, and they can do uh, they have a lot of discretion to do what they feel is uh, is best. And what we try to look at are Title One schools. Title One meaning uh, having more than half of economically disadvantaged students. Title I schools that are doing extremely well in terms of their profi academic proficiency on these indicators that we were talking about. This shows that despite having uh, uh, student um, demographics that aren't um, necessarily um, uh, favorable for all families because they're economically disadvantaged, for example, um, they're still able to um have a quality instruction, consistent instruction, and it shows up in their performance. So we would suggest that the department highlight, not only highlight, but see how they might be able to scale some of these practices because um, it's true we are in an empowered system and we do want to give flexibility to our principals and our schools. However, uh, I think the schools also would like some guidance. And I think it's the state's responsibility to try to share some of these best practices in a way that all schools can benefit. So that's really what uh, we try to encourage the department to do. And we hope that uh, these schools that are exemplary schools uh, get recognized and really analyzed to see how and why they're able to outperform. Well, I know that, uh, of course, we're getting a short on time, but maybe we can come back and talk about what some of these practices that are that are needed and are expensive and would be the the ways to expand these funds. I mean, you look at other states, how they're they're accomplishing um, these these uh, needs and doing things like big tutoring programs or other ways of uh, many other programs that can come in and assist these students, especially um, these um, high need students and um, students that you're describing. And um, I think it would be interesting to maybe go over what some of the other states are doing that are interesting communities that might have a similarity to Hawaii's circumstances and to know what would make sense. And if if we have something like that, or maybe just talking about it and recommending it is a, a way to keep stakeholders informed. I think the community and parents uh, would like to know more about what's happening with all of this funding. And I, I wasn't here for much of the campaign, so I don't know what our executive leadership, the governor and lieutenant governor, I don't know enough yet about what they're saying, but that would be another place to go to talk about what's happening with um, these enormous resources. Yeah. Right. So other states, just to give an example, uh, during the pandemic, have focused on things like literacy. Because if a student is having trouble reading, they're going to struggle throughout their uh, academic careers. And um, in addition to that, some of these other states also have a very good process of accountability, where they will look at some of these initiatives that were um, investments uh, from the federal monies to see exactly how uh, effective they were, whether it's an investment in a literacy platform or something like that. Uh, it, it is evaluated and continually evaluated to see if it's working, uh, if there are tweaks, if it can be improved. And so we would really uh, be thrilled if the department had a process like that and was able to be transparent about it and communicate it. Now, I know that Hawaii has um, 
been awarded a, a very large literacy grant. And we would hope that those funds would be used strategically, particularly uh, because the pandemic has happened and um, undoubtedly there are, are struggling uh, elementary school students who uh, would need some supports, uh, really research-based proven supports in literacy. Um, however, once again, uh, the department, while it has a website that describes the grant and describes that you know it was alloc the, the funds were allocated or awarded to I think six complex areas, uh, and it has a brief description, we're not sure of how the what the progress is and exactly uh, you know how these funds and what exactly are the uh, initiatives and activities that are being done and and uh, we would hope that we would know that progress was being made or not so again and you're talking about the we is the department of education the department of education yes the so we does not okay we so 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 the the information that's provided is very um uh, general and not specific enough for us to know what it is and how uh, how it's how the funds are being used and whether or not it's a it's a it's a good investment. Is it is it was it a strategic well, investment? And here you're addressing, of course, the accountability issue too, and not not putting into place an accountability plan that will give them that information and will incorporate the things you're talking about, like setting goals and and understanding what outcomes they're going for and what that's going to take. And then I, I know we have to finish, but that is a five year federal grant, and it's really rather paltry compared to what's already in at fifty million for five years so i mean there are many there's such largesse here in terms of funds in hawaii that i think we need to talk a lot about uh, what can be done with those if the u.s if the fed if the department of education is needing some uh, feedback i hope we can help them with that and also to increase viewers and parents and community members uh understanding of what what's happening and maybe thinking about it from their own point of views and experience so really appreciate all the information today it's been very informative and we are out of time so um i think Jerry Nakamura, who leads the AA Coalition for participating today as our guest. And um, we will um, be back in two weeks for the state of the state of Hawaii. And uh, mahalo to all our viewers and uh, aloha and happy new year to everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.